this morning, by the grace of God, we have a friend who I, I, I think it was 30 something years ago, me and we met and uh, we didn't connect again because of you depart from that part of the world and not that depart to the other part of the world. But through the help of Facebook, he located me and we connected last month. And here he is to minister to us. I'm so excited. I've been following him on Facebook, seeing the exploit he's doing in the United States of America. And uh, I'm so glad that he is part of this family standing together that we might make Jesus proud globally. Thank you so much, my dear brother and friend. And he's one of the people that also God used to sharpen me, strengthen me, inspire me to seek him more desperately. So you're welcome, sir. This is Pastor Emmanuel Elendo. He's gonna be ministering to us. Sir, please, the stage is set. Go ahead, go ahead and bless us, sir. Thank you. Be God. Thank you so much. The Lord bless you. Amen. Amen. Um, I'm really excited and grateful to God for this opportunity. Amen. Pastor Light, the Lord bless you. Amen. Uh, all the members of this network and members of your local church, Amen. the Lord bless you. Amen. Um, I thank God for the reconnection. Um, really bless the name of the Lord. It was heavily weighted on my mind that morning, and I started a search. I said, Facebook will have something. And um, thank God that your old name was still there. Otherwise, <laughs> maybe I couldn't have gotten there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, people of God, it's my pleasure to come to you this morning. Mm. I humbly bow before the Almighty who has given us life and given me the grace to occupy in this um, space. Amen. Without um, a lot of talking, uh, we'll, in due time we'll get to know one another. Um, I'm so grateful to God for the life of uh, Pastor Light. Um, I thought that I saw all this in him when we were together in 19. 87, 1988. Well, thank God that he has not wavered. He has been strong, continuing the journey. Amen. The Lord bless you. Amen. Quickly, I want us to go straight to scriptures. Um, I want us to consider, we're looking at passionate prayers. And uh, I want to drill down to pray the Lord of the harvest. Pray the Lord of the harvest. We want to read from Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9 from verse 27 to 38. Matthew chapter 9 from verse 27 to 38. When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying, crying out and saying, Son of David, Son of David, have mercy on us. Mm. When he had come unto the house or into the house, the blind man came to him. And Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? Mm. And they said to him, Yes, Lord. And he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes mm. were opened. And Jesus sternly warned them, saying, See that no one knows it. But when they had departed, they spread the news about him in that country. Verse 32. As they went out, behold, they brought to him a man, mute and demon-possessed. Mm. When the demon was cast out, the mute spoke, and the multitude marveled, saying, this, it was never seen like this in Israel. Mm. But the Pharisee said, he cast out demons by the ruler of demons. Then Jesus went out all the cities and villages, teaching oh. in their synagogues, mm -hmm. preaching the gospel of the kingdom 
and healing me. Every sickness. Oh my God. Every disease among mm. the people. Hallelujah. Every sickness and every disease among the people. Mm. But when he saw the multitude, please take note. Yes, sir. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion for them. Mm. Because they were weary and scattered like sheep, having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his mm. harvest. May the Lord yes. bless the reading of his word in the Jesus. name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Two things stand out from this passage. Mm. Two blind men received sight. Mm. A demoniac was healed. Mm. And Jesus said to them, one, the first point is this. Jesus said to them, see that no one knows it. Yes, sir. We're coming, we're going to come to the last two verses we read, but I want to catch something from what he told them. See that nobody knows it. In our age, in this our dispensation, there is something I call celebrating the untrained. Jesus said, don't spread this news. Do not tell everybody about it. Keep quiet. Why did he do that? Mm. If you read John chapter 7, John chapter 7, from verses 1 to 6, John chapter 7, 1 to 6, something happened in his house at home when the feast was about to take place. Yeah. The brethren of Jesus came to him. They told him, you do all these things. And let's, let's just read this scripture. It's after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee for he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Verse two. Now, the Jews feast of the tabernacles was at hand. Three. His brothers therefore said to him, depart from here and go into Judea that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. Mm. Mm. What did he say? For no one does this type of thing in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Mm. This was a direct, you know, by this time, the, 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 his brothers did not believe in him. James did not believe in him. All his brothers did not believe in him. They, were, they, they made caricature of him, but he was straight to the point. And he told them, my time has not yet come. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 9, he says that, see that you don't tell anybody about what I have done. Number one lesson I want us to draw from here as we clean the house and prepare for the big harvest is that there is a set time in God's timetable for your showing. There is a need for you to be, to stay in the closet and allow the Holy Spirit to brood over you, to teach you, to make you before you are shown. Mm. Jesus wants us not to be hyper and to be too excited about public appearances. Because I believe that most of us on this platform are ministers of God in the making, or already ordained ministers that the Lord is about to unleash and to use to do great things in this end time. But it will be an error to run before our time. Mm. Those of us in the making, Stay in the incubator. Yield yourself to the Lord. Jesus said in verse 6, My time has not yet come. 
but your time is always ready. For any man that will matter in the hand of God, his time will come. And God wants to prepare that man. And so I'm saying this to tell us that there is need to go through the processes of God. The, we call it the process of time. A time where God processes you, helps you to see certain things, to know certain things, and to come in at home, get a good grip of what it means to carry the whole gospel to the whole world and do all the mighty things he has designed for us to do. I call it the five, the five T's of ministry deployment. The five T's of ministry de deployment include that you and I need to be trained. We're doing housekeeping, first of all, before we get into this uh, uh, harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. We're just doing a little housekeeping. Number one, you must be trained. God wants you to be trained. You must find a mentor. You must find somebody you look up to. You must find a teacher that, that can speak into your life. They can help you grow. Number two, you must be tried. Trial is not always a bad thing. Tried the Lord, tried uh, Job, the Lord, you know, subjected him and left the devil to just decimate him and he said, but you don't touch his life, don't touch his soul. There is a time T where God allows the seasons of life to try you. You have to be tried, number two. Number three, there is need for every minister of God, every servant of God to be tested. You've got to be tested with how you handle church, and the people, you got to, God has to test you how you handle the money for the church. God has to God. test you different ways of pruning and growing you and I. God wants to be sure that what he's about to do, he can go to sleep as it were and leave the job in your hands without any scandal. Number four is that you must be trusted. Trusted. To the point that we can say, when this ministry goes worldwide, that we can leave a country, a region in your hands and nobody comes to audit you. Trust is earned. This number four is very important and it is learned in the process of time. Number five is that you must be willing to be entrusted with souls. We just read verse 38. Pray ye, pray ye, the Lord of the harvest, to send laborers. When God sends men and act, you know, recruits men into the army of God, and he makes you a commander, entrusting the lives of people into your hands, will you be ready to run and to do the long haul with such a trust, entrusted with the souls of men, with the secrets of men. That's just the housekeeping I want us to bear in mind as the Lord expands and grows this ministry and uh, takes us to nations. Five T's of ministry deployment. You keep your tab on it and the Lord will bless his people and his servants in the name of Jesus. If you look at Galatians chapter one, Galatians chapter one, um, that's an introduction Paul made of himself. He says, let's see Galatians, Galatians chapter one. Mm. Galatians chapter one, verse one. I like that scripture. Galatians chapter one, verse one. Paul, an apostle not from men, nor true man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Paul, an apostle, not from man, know ye that your calling is not from man, neither was it orchestrated by man. It was not put together by man. Your calling is from God. 
It is through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Okay, we'll go further. Verse 12, Paul said, For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Unction, power, ministry is received from God. What we train is to give guidance on doctrine, on processes, on uh, protocols, on the order the church should run so that we'll be on the same page. But the Holy Spirit is the one that really trains you. I remember way back in Okene, 1988 with Pastor Light. And uh, in that boys quarter where I was doing my youth service with the fellowship he was leading, he, the students usually come to that boys quarter, you know, to spend the weekend. And I remember when he was about to write his jump, he was already in the second year, he was to write his jump and I said, hey, what are you doing? You know, well, why, why are you leaving these children? for, and I wasn't too excited, but it was God that directed him. And he later told me the details of how God worked it out. What I saw in him, a ministry of prayer. I saw in him how God was preparing him in the area of prayer. And so I, I can deduce from what I saw and from what I am seeing today that you don't receive certain things from man. If man gives it to you, he will come the one day to, to demand his ransom. You receive the gift and the calling of, of God from God himself. So Paul did not receive his from man. If man had given it to him, man would have come back to demand some ransom. Let's go further in Galatians. Galatians chapter one, from verse 15, he says, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to receive or to reveal his son to me. And no, I did not, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. Verse 17, it says, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to, uh, that scripture is telling us that Paul, with all his exploits, with all the anointing, went to Arabia. Till verse 18, he went to Arabia, he stayed there for three years, studying and learning before he went to Jerusalem to see the other apostles. What is that telling us as a housekeeping effort we're trying to do now? Is that God wants us to stay connected with him, not to rush to go start our ministries, those of us who have been called to leadership position but to learn at his feet and to be brooded over by the Holy Spirit for the day of our showing. Amen. Hallelujah. Don't forget. Now let's jump to the meat of our discussion. That scripture, we discovered that there were two groups of people that were attacking Jesus. The Pharisees were in one camp, if you read verses 34 and 30, 33 and 34 of Matthew chapter 9, they were attacking Jesus. So he cast out demons by with, the, with demons. I don't know how that would be possible to cast out demons with uh, demons. But there was also this camp of Jesus, people who believed him. They said it was never seen like this in Israel. Those who recognized the miracle that Jesus did. It has never happened like this in Israel. My take from this scripture is, as we go out, as we reach out to the nations, as we deploy people to pray and engage in prayers, we will be met with oppositions. The Bible says, but don't fear. I have already, already overcome the world. Hallelujah. I have overcome the world. Hallelujah. Do not fear. Sure. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. God wants us to move with speed. Mm. He wants us to do his work 
He mm. says, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. There is need to speed up action and to walk fast because the end is here. Listen, mm. I know that the end is here. Yes, sir. Something that touched and troubled me was this prayer or this request by Jesus. He said, pray. Why didn't Jesus just employ people? He asked us to pray. Why didn't he just by his power, you know, recruit men immediately? I see the pain of Jesus. I see the lamentations of Jesus. I see his hand that is, as it were, shortened by our unavailability, by our inconsistency, by our withdrawal to do the work of ministry. God is waiting on us, his hands, his energy on earth to apply this hand, apply this energy in his work. Lamentations of Jesus. Uh, as I was looking, looking at the pains in the heart of Jesus when he said, pray the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into the harvest. My mind went straight to, you know, when Jesus worked over Jerusalem. Jesus beheld Jerusalem. In Luke chapter 19, verses 41 to 44. He looked at Jerusalem. He said, oh, Jerusalem. He wept over Jerusalem. He said, if you had known the days of your visitation, if you had known the, the, the days of your peace, Luke chapter 9, from verse 41 to 44. If you had known, but now they are hidden from you. The Bible says he wept over Jerusalem. As Jesus looks at us and pleads with, with us, Pray that the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into the harvest field. What does he feel? How does he feel? He saw the city and he worked over it. When Jesus looks at the church today, does he weep? What drops Jesus' heart is the souls are dying and perishing. He, he looked at the city, he wept over it. When Jesus looks at your local church, what does he, how does he feel? I, I'll give you an example. We moved to a new facility. Uh, there, 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 was, there was so much crowd, so much people. It was before the church divided and some people took a chunk of it and went away. I said, good. And then the revelation God ushered me into the heavens. And I am. Um, I was so excited. I thought I had died. Uh, I was so excited to see the black, the white, everybody, you know, some Chinese were there. The streets were made of gold. I was just excited, I was happy. Suddenly in my happiness, in joy, I had my, my name, Emmanuel. Emmanuel, where are the members of your congregation? I said, it's true. I started searching. Brethren, what I'm telling you is real, it's truth. I searched. I mean, we were so many in that, in our church, the local church here. Three, four hundred, five hundred people. I searched for one member. I searched and searched and searched until I found one. Till today, that person didn't know I found him. I said, brother, let's search for other people. We searched in the crowd. We didn't see any other person. Mm. And the Lord translated me, and I came back to him. That morning, I wept and wept because not the crowd we're talking about. Mm. There are few that have made it. Mm. And since then, my message changed to this in the church. So what I'm trying to say is that what disturbs Jesus 
what traps his heart is to see men go to hell. Go in church, go in the society, go in the government. What troubles him is to see men. And when we pray, please, let's take note that we can focus on the souls of men, the souls of men, that they will not go to hell and that we will apply our energies to reaching out to them because God says, pray that the Lord will send harvest, send laborers into his harvest. In the church, in the society, in the, in, in the political sphere, there is need to preach the gospel and the type of gospel that will take men to heaven. Pray. Let's look at the, the case of uh, Mary and Martha and Jesus at Lazarus' death. Let's, let's look at it. I like that scripture too. When I talk about the pains in the heart of Jesus, the pains in the heart of Jesus. Uh, John chapter 11, John chapter 11, uh, I think from verse 33, John chapter 11, John chapter 11 from verse 33, it says, therefore when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Look at Jesus groaning. And he said, where have you led him? Talking about Lazarus. And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus again, what? Second weeping. And the Jews said, see how he loved him. And some of them said, please not take note of verse 37. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Very legitimate question. Very important question. Couldn't he have kept him from dying? We remember the case in the Matthew chapter 8. You know, the, 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 the centurion. He said, no, 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 don't come to my house. Just, just speak the word, Lord. Speak the word, and my servant is here. Jesus spoke the word. He said, I have never seen such a faith in Israel. He could have spoken the word. But Jesus waited until Lazarus died and was buried. And Jesus, again, the third groaning in this short passage. Again, then Jesus, again, groaning in himself, he came to the tomb. What makes Jesus groan? What really makes him groan? When he says, send ye, pray that the, the father will send laborers into his harvest. What do you think that makes Jesus a groan? Was it that he could not have you know, raised Lazarus from wherever he was? The Jews asked this question, and they were right. Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept his, this man from dying? That was the reason that, to the best of my understanding, why Jesus groaned. When Jesus saw Lazarus, when Jesus saw corpse, an incapacitated corpse, uh, and a, 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 a human being that the Lord created in his own image that should be fortified with power and with energy, when Jesus saw the inability and the, the shortcomings of men, when Jesus saw how the devil is messing around with lies and killing and sending the Lord to hell, Jesus weeps. When Jesus saw the, um, a church that is not powerful, a church that cannot pray, a church that cannot intercede, Jesus weeps. When Jesus sees in us this time, our, our emotions and our, our vibes uh, are orchestrated by the things we see and handle, Jesus weeps. When our, uh, our mantra in the church has shifted from soul winning, from making candidates for heaven, when we have shifted it from making candidates of heaven to making money in the church, Jesus weeps. When Jesus sees a powerless church that cannot even pray for migraine headache to go, you know, not to talk of raising the dead, Jesus weeps. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 82, don't you know, verse from verse 5 and 6, don't you know, 
you know, it's, it's, it forces says that the, 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 the earth is out of joint, that the earth is in, in is shaking, is, 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 is dismembered because you are gods. You do not know, no, you don't understand. You grew up in darkness, you walk around, you know, without, you say that the foundation of the earth has been shaken, it's unstable. But he says in verses, he said, don't, don't you know that you are gods? Don't you know that power, certain power is in you, is residing in you? Don't you know? Can't you wake up, church? Do you understand the power of the resurrection that's been injected in to you? For this reason, Jesus was. What trumps Jesus' heart is to see a church that is not powerful. It's to see a church that has shifted from the main focus to trivialities, to mm. mundane things. Mm. And I want us to take note that if we must do the work of the master in the right way, we must focus on heaven and eternity. Pastor Light was preaching one of those opening, uh, opening sessions. He says that we will use everything we have. We will weaponize our profession. We will weaponize that, I think from Jewel chapter, chapter three from verses nine and 10. Mm. He says, sharpen your, your, your war instrument, your weapons, whatever you have. In fact, in Luke, Luke chapter 22, Luke chapter 22 from verse 35 down, you know, he says, now, if I told you before in Luke chapter 10, that you go out and you, you preach the gospel and the, the laborer is worthy of his wages, you know, don't, don't carry pause, don't carry this, don't, don't take, yes, I told you then to do that. But now I tell you, he who has no sword, let him sell his garments and buy one. He who has no profession should go look for a profession so that you can get resources to power the gospel. I tell you that the resources you have, the skill sets, you have a profession, you're a medical doctor, you're a lawyer, you are this, you are that, you're a politician. These are tools. These, the skill sets you have are tools and weapons in your hand that you can use to pursue the end game. The end game is souls for the kingdom. The end game is to, to catch the big picture, which is heaven. Praise God. Number three point I want to bring, bring up before I close is, I will pray on this. As we touch the things that Jesus is weeping about, we must have a vision of man as sight. We must also have a vision of heaven. Let it never go away from us. The vision of man, the end of man. And that was drives compassion. That's what drives compassion. If you know, if you understand the end of man, in Psalm chapter 71, he says that his end is like a slippery, slippery slope. He's, he's headed for destruction. I was to go minister in Calgary, 2015, May 27, no. August 27th, it was a weekend program. They were waiting for me. So I took a flight from Cincinnati, Ohio, went to Chicago. From Chicago, we boarded a flight to Calgary for three hours flight or so. As we were taking off, I was praying, Lord, lead us safely. Let this meeting be a successful meeting. Just casual prayer, just casual prayer. Talking about having a vision of man, where man is headed to. As the aircraft took off, look at this angel of death. I'm talking about, I was awake, I was sitting in an aircraft, an angel of death came into the aircraft. He came, stood by me, I said, oh Lord, is this the way we are going to meet you? So this aircraft, aircraft is going to crash. Mm. He stood by me. 
make sure that I recognize that he was there. Huge. Mm. Nobody needed to tell me that he was an angel of death. Mm. I looked, he was still there, standing beside me. Say, ah, mm. Lord, what is this? So we're going to go home like this. Thank God I called my wife and he said, bye bye. Search my heart. I say, if it, if it so be, let it be. For about three minutes after, he took two, two, three steps forward, went to row 10. And this the Arabian woman I, I boarded the aircraft with was there. It was like, it was telling him, telling her, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Brethren, that day I saw how death catches or takes away his soul. The woman started dying. And meanwhile, men in the aircraft were like dead frogs, dead frogs. Everybody was bowed down, unable to do anything. I saw men like dead frogs. And then uh, I found out this man, this woman, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. I was praying, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. I was looking for something that had a picture of Jesus just to show this woman about Jesus. I didn't have a picture I didn't, I, because she couldn't speak English. She couldn't understand me. I was the one that read her manifest to have a seat. And so when he left, when the angel left, he just disappeared. People woke up. Oh, there was rancor in the aircraft trying to save the soul of this man, woman. And she was dying. She was going. She was going. The pilot had to announce, hey, we have to go back to Chicago because we had an emergency, we have an emergency and uh, we handle it in the aircraft. We turned back and went back to Chicago. 27th of August, 2015. What am I trying to say? If you know, if you see the end of man, you walk the streets of your city, preaching the gospel, using everything you have to tell someone that Jesus saves. If you understand the end of man, you will not spare anyone without telling the person that Jesus saves, that he needs to give his life to Jesus. You will not spare any church goer who is using church as a camouflage to cover certain inconsistencies and certain, certain behaviors that he will go to hellfire. We're talking about revival in this end time. And brethren, I want to let us know that God is waiting on us. Jesus said, pray ye the Father that he will send laborers into his harvest. And that's the pain of God. Do we have a vision of God? Do we have heaven as our focus, as our final destination? Many people in church don't. Many people have come for some other things. It's time to weaponize all that we have towards the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Pray ye that I want us to pray. I want us to pray that the Lord of the heavens, you will, you will start this prayer with, Lord, I offer myself as a living sacrifice today. I offer myself to be used. Father, is there anything that will hinder me from such a use by you? Lord, remove it tonight. Lord, I present myself as a living sacrifice, ready to be poured like a libation on your altar. God <coughs> wants you to be a God on earth, to, to monitor and, you know, we talk about uh, territorial spirits. I was talking to the, to the ministers, territorial spirits. We, we so much amplify territorial spirits and demons. But do you know that God wants you to be, uh, to be in charge of your own territory, to decimate and scatter the coalition of evil altars in your neighborhood, in your company, in wherever you find yourself. That God wants you to build altars, territorial servants of God, territorial ministers, territorial occupants, 
those who have weaponized their skill set, their profession, and have occupied as priests in their different locations. Do you know that these territorial spirits are having a field there because we have no reason to the occasion of dismantling their altars? God wants us to do everything, everything, everything within our power to dismantle all the demonic altars and all the coalitions against his church, against the counsel of God, against his second coming. I want us to pray, Lord, I call myself, I present myself as a living sacrifice. I pour myself as an offering, an offering. Lord, use me. Please, I want us to pray before Pastor Light takes over. I want us to pray for ourselves. Sharpen me like a trushing, sharp trushing instrument. Let me be used by you using this platform, using this organization. Lord, I don't care. I don't care the church you belong to. What we're talking about cuts across churches. Church denomination has, has bedeviled us, has hindered us. God wants us to wake up from every part of this world. Get out of denomination. It's, it's, there's something wrong about this denominationalism. Can't you see the power of God at, at work? in different areas, different locations, different territories? Can't you take your own stand and weaponize your profession, your skill set? Whatever you do, whatever you do, they are just but tools in the hand of God. In this case, in your own hand that you can use to dismantle every altar, every altar. Oh, God help us. Can we pray? Lord, make me a sharp, fresh instrument. Lord, make me a sharp threshing instrument. Lord, make me a sharp threshing instrument. A weapon of war. Lord, I will start with my church. I will start with my profession at my business. Lord, say pray ye therefore. We are going to take the second prayer point. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest. He will say, but first of all, let's pray for ourselves. A sharp fashion instrument. A sharp fashion instrument. Or you will beat your mountain like small. That's the word of God. You know, that's that chapter one. He said, you will beat your mountain like small. You are a soldier. You are an army. An army in the hand of our God. Who is ready to make a good harvest. And a big harvest for that matter. Pray for yourself. Lord, I present my sacrifice. Living sacrifice. Living sacrifice. Living sacrifice. Not ready, acceptable by God. Lord, in any area I have not measured, I'm not measuring up. Lord, reveal such to me. Reveal it to me. Lord, I need you to do this one. I've got to do this one. Pray. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray for my. Jesus Christ. Pray. Can we pray? I want to pray. I want you to guys your base and know that God is in the house. Very men and women for a big harvest. You are one of them. You are a part of the harvest. The force of God. Oh 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 God. I 
Unmute yourself, sir. Unmute yourself. Second prayer point. So we're going to pray that the Lord of the harvest will send laborers. If you know how scarce it is to recruit men into this workforce, mm. in Africa is different. If you know how hard it is here, where dollar is the, 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 the new king, if you know how hard it is, I pray that the Lord will recruit men into his arms. Mm. Lord, send laborers. As you are saying now, send laborers. You are not saying send them and I will stay back. Mm. You are offering yourself as a living sacrifice. Remember an offered a, a, a an animal offered for sacrifice does not own himself again. He doesn't walk back to his mate, owner. He doesn't own himself again. He has relinquished the right of, to live. He has turned in himself. God sent me, sent laborers into your workforce. Yes, Lord. Father, what we're talking about is that you will start with your own self and your location. Pray that the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into his yes, harvest. Sir. Laborers into his harvest. Lord, send me. Lord, I want to start a Bible club. Lord, I want to start a prayer meeting at my workplace. Lord, I want to start a fellowship of the, the extended fellowship. Now, listen, you are a workforce. Send laborers. As I give myself to it, Lord, send men. Bring men, let's pray that prayer. Bring it's men, bring women. Father, in the name of Jesus, we offer our in the name of Jesus, so that you work and in this end times, Lord, as you are called, like you, Hey, may, may I meet yourself, Pastor? Pastor Light, can you continue, please? All right. Thank you so much, servant of God. Thank you, and thank you again. That was awesome. That was very, very inspirational and impactful. 